right, everybody. Okay, so let me introduce to you uh, who is up here on stage with me. To my immediate left is Craig Silverstein, the executive producer and the showrunner here of Turn. Uh, he began his writing career on Sci-Fi's The Invisible Man in USA's The Dead Zone, and since then has worked on numerous television series. Most recently, he created and executive produced the CW series Nikita, and was a co-creator and executive producer on the Steven Spielberg produced dinosaur drama Terra Nova. And previously, he worked with 20th Century Fox Television on a number of series, including Bones. Speaking of Bones, to his left is Barry Josephson, who is also an executive producer on Turn. Uh, his television credits include the EP, executive producer on Bones, I guess every episode of Bones ever made. Uh, he's also a uh, producer in both film and television. Recent film credits include Enchanted, Aliens in the Attic, Life as We Know It. Uh, earlier, he was the uh, senior vice president for production for Columbia and Sony Pictures. So some movies you may have heard of he's responsible for, like Men in Black, Air Force One, In the Line of Fire, The Fifth Element, Anaconda, I wasn't going to mention that, but yeah. Bad Boys. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't have Wild Wild West on here for whatever reason, but uh, and now Jamie Bell, and now Jamie Bell uh, who plays Abe Woodhull on the on the show Turn. Uh, you may know him uh, as a when he as a teenager. He shot the worldwide fame as the title role in Billy Elliot. Uh, he received many honors for his performance, including a BAFTA award for Best Actor and the British Independent Film Award for Best Newcomer. He also has many film credits under his belt, including Clint Eastwood's acclaimed Flags of Our Fathers, Peter Jackson's Epic King Kong, and Doug, Ly Doug Lyman's Jumper. And you will see him very soon as Ben Grimm in the Fantastic Four, which will come out very soon. Don't clap that, don't yeah. clap that. Which, wasn't Michael Chiklis the last one? That's a pretty dramatic. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a tall order to match <laughs> yes. Chiklis. Yeah. To Jamie's left is Heather Lind, who plays Anna Strong on Turn. Previously on Broadway, she played opposite Al Pacino in The Merchant of Venice, for which she won the Theatre World Award for Outstanding Broadway Debut. She's also starred in A Winner's Tale and Pygmalion as Eliza Doolittle. Her television credits include a recurring role in HBO's Boardwalk Empire, for which Lynn won a SAG Award for Outstanding Performance by an Ensemble in a Drama Series. To her left is Bern Gorman, who plays Major Hewitt. You may have seen him in many things, uh, he was born in the United States, grew up in the United Kingdom. Uh, he's worked across a, just about every single kind of art field you could potentially imagine. You might recognize him from major roles in Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight Rises, Guillermo del Toro's Pacific Rim, FX's It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and HBO's Game of Thrones, which I, I won't ask you about how it was to be in two shows competing with each other uh, on <laughs> Sunday evenings. Um, you don't have to worry about that anymore. And then finally, is Alex Rose, who is the co-producer and writer of Turn. The Turn series itself, as Peter mentioned in the very beginning, is based on Alex Rose's Washington Spies. And after serving as consultant for the first season, Rose joined as co-producer and writer for season two. Now, a plug for Alex Rose, his latest book, Men of War, The American Soldier in Combat at Bunker Hill, Gettysburg, and Iwo Jima, comes out in June of this year, right? Uh, yes, that is correct. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Really. So again, uh, please join me in welcoming the people who make Turn possible. Yeah. So my, my first question can be tackled by, by either Craig or Barry. It, it's a, uh, a, a question that pr many producers may not have to deal with, especially ones doing something historical or even spy-related television shows. And the fact that most of the stuff on TV, it's very easy for us to identify with characters. It's something that during our lifetime is set, or during our parents' lifetime. This is something where you have to invent an entirely new world, where, where people know a little bit about the history of the revolutionary period, but no one knows anybody who was around during that time. It's, it's an environment that none of us can really identify with other than when we were in third grade in our classes. Is that dramatically more difficult? Is that why you had to take a lot of time to introduce us to the world in turn in the first season? That's what, something I appreciated. I, mean, I appreciated the fact that we didn't jump right into the action. It's so easy to do in spy TV shows or spy movies where all of a sudden somebody's running around being chased. But you make it a point. It was a show decision to make it a point to say, we're going to make sure you're invested in this environment, not just the characters, but the whole setting across the board. 
Uh, was that a conscious decision that you had to make, or was it difficult to do from the very beginning? Uh, yeah, it was. It was a conscious decision. Um, the, uh, but it was more. It was more about educating people as to what this world really was, as opposed to what they may have thought it was. Um, you know, uh, it's it's a little bit different than than the way that I think we're 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 taught um, in schools. And uh, as far as the period uh, thing goes, I don't think it's harder to relate necessarily. You get right in with people. I mean. Luke Skywalker lived a long time before these guys, and you were right there with him. So yeah, but but because of that, and because of because I was I I was learning so much um, about uh, how different the world, uh, the Revolutionary War, and that the that the chaotic period of Revolutionary time was so much different than the very um, sort of David and Goliath, very simplistic version that I was taught in school. I thought it took a little more time to kind of uh, get the try to get the, a little bit of those shades in. Because you do have the problem that people come to the show thinking they know about the history of the revolutionary period. They, they think they know the story. You know, they think they learned it back in grade school, and there's just this whole other element to it that you're presenting to them, and you almost have to, you know, unteach them what they think they understand about the revolution. Um, yeah, and, and sometimes that rubs up against what, you know, somebody wants to see. I mean, this season you see George Washington, you know, become uh, vulnerable, um, and it's not something, he's the guy on the dollar bill. He's just absolutely... Um, you know, strong in in every single aspect, and and the truth is that uh, uh, he had some some severe moments of doubt, and it's just not something we're used to seeing. So someone might look at it and go, "That's not the George Washington I know," you right. know. But it's like, well, you didn't know him. Yeah. You know, <laughs> this is the way it is. Yeah. So so Jamie, let me let me ask you the question about your character because a, a Woodhull is if there is a main character, it, it's a but now. You know, there's so many interesting characters that, that without them, you don't have this show. Uh, there's a pretty dramatic transformation, I would say, in, in this, at least this first episode with Abe. I mean, you, you almost have him suiting up like Batman at one point with, with his knife and the, everything else. Thinking back to the first episode of season one and just this, this scared, unsure man who just doesn't understand his role in this broader, you know, war, uh, do you see that transformation? I mean, you know what the rest of the season's looking like. I mean, without giving away too much, do you see that transformation continuing? Is that a, a conscious character decision that's being made? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, um, uh, I mean, the, the show is very much an ensemble show, as you can see. Um, it's filled with fantastic characters across the board, my fellow castmates here. So, I mean, uh, I think the way into the story, though, was very much about an everyman, uh, a, a farmer, a family man, who um, was resistant. He was hesitant to stand up for his beliefs. He knew his father was on a different side than he was, and that was going to present problems. It was going to be turbulent. And I think in the first season, what we, what we kind of started with was a guy who literally wanted nothing more than the war to stay away from his front door. And I think that was a good way into it, because it wasn't a, 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 a guy who was so willing to jump into high water. He was terrified. He was he was dragged into this kicking and screaming, you know. And uh, I don't want to, can I spoil things at the end of first season one? Yes, I can. Yeah. yeah, it's out already. It's on Netflix. Watch it tonight. Uh, uh, but, you know, basically in the end of the first season, if you haven't seen it, uh, a bunch of events happen and he ends up taking a life in his own house. So the, the, the season one starts, you know, by the end, the, the war is literally uh, on his doorstep. And I think that was just a good way in. I think now we know that what this guy has to play with, what he has to risk. We know that he loves his son dearly. We know that his relationship with his father, the idea of legacy, what he's going to in, uh, inherit, um, means something to him. And, and this decision to, to work for Washington, to help the rebels, to further the cause, is going to leave him out in the cold and, and potentially get him killed. Um, and I think we wanted to start season two with the determination. You know, the idea that this character has doubled down, he's lied to everyone, and he's continuing this mission. And I think for the season arc for this character is that his chips are all in. He's all in on this mission. So, Heather, you, you're from New York. You, you went to Fordham and NYU. Was this a story you were familiar with growing up? What, what had happened during the... I mean, I, I, I grew up in a, in a place where the revolution didn't touch. It was Spain. It was Florida. But you're right in the middle of where this is taking place. I mean, New York City, Long Island. 
w was this a story you heard of growing up? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, we'd studied the we, we studied the Revolutionary War and we studied the Battle of Saratoga was probably touched on quite a bit because it was so near where I grew up. I grew up just outside Albany, and so I I sort of was familiar that there were historic places <laughs> around me. But honestly, I mean, and I think my education was as good as it could be. I mean, we had so much to cover. And it was more than these guys got, but um, but yeah, um, I I think I felt like I knew the basics of the battles, and I knew that that George Washington was a hero, and I knew that the redcoats were bad, and and I think that in terms of education, that's not like the educator's fault necessarily, but there's so much more to every story, um, and so when I, when I came onto this project, I I realized how little I knew about the real people who were confronting this conflict and the, the real women and the families. I mean, it was just like these small economies that were so hugely affected by it. And, you know, if you can imagine being sort of a lower, low-class family having to house an enemy to your government, I mean, it's just unfathomable, actually. If you can't even afford to feed your family and then you're forced to feed these people who you don't agree with and who are essentially conquering your town. I mean, it's just horrifying. And so I think I think the idea of the show that's so brilliant is that it wasn't this historical conflict that we've come to know through our education. It's this, it was this really small town revolution. And it feels um, exciting in that way and accessible and, and new to me um, as an American. So Byrne, you, you play the red coat. You play the bad guy. Um, <laughs> that's right. But your, your major Hewlett, it, it would be very easy for you to, to play it way over the top, to, to play the sinister, bad British guy. I mean, you, Simcoe is a bad guy in real life, so it's not hard for that character to come across as, hey, he is. If you, read, if you read Alex Rose's book, he's not a good dude. But Hewlett is somebody that you could have played either way. And what I think comes across is he's a human. And you do see that at the end of season one, and you also see that at the beginning of season two. And I think it really speaks to the idea that the Americans and the British aren't so dramatically different at this point, uh, and that there really are people who are trying to, to piece together uh, this, uh, you know, what people see as a, a, a not absolute path to independence. Uh, how hard was it not to come across as the meanie? I mean, you're, you're the bad guy. I mean, it would have been much easier for you to be over the top. Sure. I think that it was very apparent from when I first got the first script that Craig and Barry and the whole creative team had a quite a clear idea about um, not presenting it as just black and white. I think from my own personal point of view, I try and approach every character um, to find the grey, you know, to find the humanity in them all. But, you know, the first time we meet Hewlett... Um, He's talking about law and order and authority, and essentially he was there, a good man, essentially a middle manager, um, you know, trying to do the best that he can in uh, in these extraordinary um, circumstances. But um, me personally, just approaching any character, I try and look at at, at uh, try and find the grey areas rather than black and white. You know, it was such a strange time in terms of divided loyalties and. Uh, from Hewlett's point of view, he's there to do a job which he's been sent there to do by his king, who is, uh, you know, if not the mouthpiece of God, then certainly the, the highest authority, and he's going to follow that through. The complexity comes from when he's, from what, what he, he comes up against, meeting uh, the, the other side, you know, the humanity there. So, Alex, I'm not giving any way, anything away in this case because on the AMC website it does have a little preview of season two, and there's a new character, a, a real world character, actually a, a, a very important part of the Culper ring that is introduced in season two, and that's Culper Jr., that's Robert Townsend. Can you talk a little bit about who we're going to meet in the next couple episodes, in the, in the real world, who is Robert Townsend in real life? Um, okay, well, I'd be very careful how I tread here yeah. because there's a lot of people staring at me if I give something too, you know, too much, uh, if I give something away. But uh, Robert Townsend is basically um, uh, sort of a is one of the more one of the most interesting of the the Culper Ring agents in that he was the only one who didn't grow up with them from childhood. 
Um, you know, the Copa Ring were basically sort of one-man dogs in that, you know, they'd all grown up together. They only worked for George Washington. They all knew each other. And that was that kind of circle of trust so that they, that's one of the reasons why the British never, were never able to, to penetrate or, or blow the network, um, you know, with informers and, and, and doubles and so forth, which is the usual way of, 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 uh, of, of destroying these um, agents. Um, so, you know, letting Townsend in was a huge risk. So he had to pass all kinds of, um, you know, sort of tests, I guess. And that's what we kind of show in the show. And he's, he's also not an entire, I don't want to give too much away, he's not entirely um, voluntary. Um, so we, there's all sorts of uh, nefarious skullduggery going on to uh, it, it lure him, or invite him, if you prefer, into the, uh, into, into the ring. That's pl you got the word skullduggery in there, yeah. so I think the answer Thanks. is Thank is, you, is thank you. Well. Yes, Tom Fullery. <laughs> I'll drop it in again if you yes. don't mind. And nefarious. So, yes, and nefarious. <laughs> so let me, let me actually keep it with you really quickly, because I think okay. this, is a, it, this is really kind of holistic for the cast. You, you've got British actors playing Americans and, and American-born actors playing Brits and, and a lot of mixture across the board. And Australians, don't forget. And Australians. The, the Australians and, and, just get everywhere. Yeah, yeah so it, there's a... There's I'm, a I'm from Australia. You know, there's you know, a five like, eyes, for those of you know who it is, covered <laughs> across the board here. Um, there's a question that I've asked, and this actually could be maybe burn as well. Wasn't your father a linguistics professor at one point? Yeah. So maybe this is a question that I've never seen answered to my satisfaction. Oh, yeah. Did the founding fathers have English accents? <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Well, but yeah. maybe Alex as well can make do, do you are uh, the accents? Well, I think um, I, it's a very tricky sort of linguistic question <laughs> uh, and it's sort of filled with uh, you know it's a filled with it's a minefield basically uh, basically I think you could probably say uh, that English accents in the 18th century were not English accents as we now know them I mean there was no there was no sort of received pronunciation the kind of Oxford you know sort of uh, Hewlettian Oxford um, you know upper class uh, yeah, the RP, you know, so that there, there was different vowel pronunciations and so with different pronunciations of words and so on so this idea um, that all you know that all the uh, the Brits talk real posh kind of thing. That's sort of um, that's sort of an imposition that 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 you know that we've all grown up with, mostly from sort of Hollywood movies right. from the thirties. You know, with um, and uh, but you know as I said, people kind of expect it. That's why it's kind of in there. It's an instant identifier of of class and so on. But uh, yeah, so to, um, you know, it's a very uh, short answer made very long. But uh, basically, they 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 didn't speak. They didn't speak like us, basically. So I, I'd like to ask Heather and actually Baby Barry as well, and actually both producers can be part of this question, because Anna Strong, historically, there's not a lot known about her. I, you know, Abe Woodhall, Jamie, you have you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of Alex's book as background. Even Major Hewlett pops up over and over again. Anna Strong, there's not a lot of source material. Heather, how did you go about constructing this character without a lot of background? And as producers, what was the decision to increase, or uh, uh, increase the role might be the wrong word, but she may have had an unbelievably large role, but we just don't know. Like, where, where was that as part of the conversation about how much to include the Anna Strong historical figure in this show? Uh, I'm going to start from my ignorant position, which was coming in, um, I didn't realize she was a real person until my third audition. Um, I think I came in, I mean, I'd never heard of her. I'd never heard of any of them, honestly. But somehow a woman spy seemed really unbelievable to me, and I sort of ashamed to admit that. And then I, my third audition, I thought, you know, I should research this a little. <laughs> so I um, Googled her, and... And it was fascinating. There wasn't any information on her, except the first sort of thing that came up on Google was this um, uh, classroom in Virginia was had their online curriculum up, and it was um, just children's drawings of Anna with her laundry line. It was like 25 drawings that kids made of this woman next to her laundry line. And I just thought, like, like good teacher, great. <laughs> but like, whoever this teacher was, I need to look her up, actually. Um, but I, that was the first sort of feeling that I had that she mattered, you know, bizarrely, because it felt like 
all these children are being educated now that women were a part of this. And um, I didn't grow up so long ago, but I didn't get taught any of that. So I, I was inspired by that. And I think that kind of triggered a lot of curiosity about what wasn't written about uh, women in history, and I sort of investigated that a little bit, and it's hard to know. I mean, they didn't have agency, they didn't have power, so they didn't write stories about them, really, in general. Um, so I think it felt like a privilege to try to represent her, and also just imagine, I think because we didn't know for sure, it was a, it was a good bet and a dramatic bet to just assume she was really <laughs> a part of it, and then from that point on, it felt like we could kind of play and see uh, sort of see how powerful we could make her believably. And that felt really exciting to me as a, as a modern woman. So that's where I started off. Yeah, I mean, Barry, did that give you the, you know, the flexibility to go, or, or Craig, did that give you the flexibility to go as far as you felt, I mean, you don't have this defined historical figure that, you know, if you go f too far outside of it, then people are like, hold on. You have somebody that you can do a lot with and actually make it to where you know, Anna Strong becomes a much, perhaps a much bigger part of the Culper Ring, but who knows, maybe just as big, and you may actually not be going far enough. Um, it, does that give you a bit of freedom that a normal historical period drama would not? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, women did a lot during the war and we're not getting, given credit. Um, the things that we took uh, from Anna Strong is we knew that her husband, Sela Strong, had been taken, had been imprisoned, um, and that we also knew that at some point, uh, uh, Abe Woodhall had asked her to pose as his wife to make to get past checkpoints um, to get into New York City, and so so those two things uh, we took and, and started to, to broaden out uh, as much as we could. Um, some people think that Anna Strong is uh, Agent Three Five Five, who is mentioned in um, Culper Intelligence. Three Five Five wasn't the name given the code name given to a certain agent. Three Five Five in the Culper glossary, the, the spy glossary stood for lady. Um, but we say that, uh, we reveal who 355 is um, this season, and it's not Anna Strong, it's another woman. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of other women who enter uh, the picture this year, um, Peggy Shippen, and I mean, you saw one in the, the pilot, she got taken out, but um, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Patience Wright, is, it was a real um, spy um, who worked for, um, uh, the Americans and sent stuff back to Ben Franklin in her waxworks. Um, she wasn't caught and killed. We did that to her. Um, but now maybe people will look her up and actually see the patient's right existed. Uh, right. So that's, you know, part of the whole thing. And, and maybe that's the question for, for you is, is when do you decide the direction of the plot? What kind of historical liberties can you take uh, with something that is a real historical story? I mean, how... How far can you go before you're going too far, in your personal opinion? Well, I think um, for Craig, it was smart to realize from the very beginning, much is known, much is unknown. And if you want to tell a really great narrative, and you want to tell a story, you want to connect the dots, it's 250 years ago, and so much is unknown. And these were spies that were never caught, never uncovered, never found out. So the ring started and the ring grew and it expanded and it served Washington to a great degree. But they did a great job. So I think what Craig had to do with the writing staff was do as much research as possible, use Alex's book to the best degree that they could, and Alex was part of our staff, to sort of inform as much to then connect the dots and create a narrative for the show. Um, you know, we hit all the historical landmarks during the period. We try to be as accurate as possible. But I think um, when you jump into something that is historical fact, you also have to breathe into it a little bit of fiction in order to create the story. I, I also think, you know, if you really look out there and you look at many histori historians and you look at books and research that are done, they make certain assertions. They take certain leaps. So I think it's fair for us to do the same thing. So let's, let's open it up to the audience. You, you don't need to hear me asking all these questions. So please wait for the mic to get to you uh, so everyone can hear you, and we are recording this. Uh, so just if you got a question, raise your hand, and we will come to you. If not, I've got more questions, but I figure that you guys have some things you want to ask as well. Don't be shy. There's one. All right. And Jason will come to you. Thank you. Uh, this is for Mr. Bell. Also fantastic first episode of the second season. Really excited to see how it plays out. Um, Mr. Bell, 
Jamie, go, please. Jamie, 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 Jamie. Over the last few years, right. man, you've been <laughs> in a bunch of really great roles where you kind of play the underdog, the unassuming character that kind of steps out of his mold and just rebels in a great way, like Defiant, Snowpiercer, now Turn. Um, can we expect more of this? Like, do you think you thrive in that kind of a role? Because personally, I, I enjoy it a lot, so. Well, thank you. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Someone pointed out, an, another, an actor that I was working with at the time, um, I can't remember what movie it was, but uh, he pointed out something, he was like, dude, you always play orphans. <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't, I don't. And I looked back and I was like, usually my character usually has one parent dead, or they're both dead, or like there's no mention of any parents at all. <laughs> so like there, there is a continuity, and I think there is something about actors like you establish your own sense of a continuity, whatever it is, like whether it be orphan or underdog, or whatever it is that I think people just want to see you do. Those roles often kind of come to you. For example, I said to my agent like years ago, I, was like, I hate period pieces. I hate them. <laughs> Always in them though. Don't know how that happens. <laughs> I don't know how that happens. I must have a face, something about the face. I don't know. But I don't know what it is. It's not a conscious choice. I don't know. I, I think whenever I read it, I think this is what I was talking about the other night, this other thing, is whenever I read something where I go, like, I understand what that is. I think we all, we've all had a feeling of being an underdog at some point. We've all had to rise against something and, and get out of a situation or stand up for someone or something. And I love those kinds of characters. I just think they're very moving noble characters. I think the world needs those kinds of characters. You know, um, Billy Elliot is, is a, a big character for that, specifically. So I, that's where I started from. It's very much a part of my heritage. It's very much a part of who I am. So I think I, I do kind of attract myself to those kinds of things. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, well, well spotted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All the way in the back, Jason. There you go. Jamie and Mr. Gorman, you've gone from this role, Jamie, you were in Flags of Our Fathers, and Mr. Gorman was in one of, where he played a Nazi. How did you prepare differently for those roles as opposed to this one? <laughs> I, know it's, I know it's a big time differential, but I heard that Clint Eastwood had all his actors read not only Flags of Our Fathers, but other books to prepare, but how did you kind of prepare as well? Um, uh, we did read, um, I believe it's James Bradley, I believe wrote the book, um, wrote a fantastic book, and then Paul Haggis, who's a great screenwriter, wrote a great script. Um, but I will tell you, uh, Clint Eastwood does not do any form of, um, at least with the actors, any form of preparation at all. Uh, he, you know, I mean, <laughs> which is crazy when you're dealing with like pyrotechnics and explosions and you know the Battle of Iwo Jima, um, because you know there's like strafing things all over the floor and there's explosions going off and he's just like, okay, guys. Uh, <laughs> Go for it. And you're like, but where is all the bombs coming from? <laughs> Which I think he likes that. You know, he obviously likes that from actors. He, you know, he trusts his actors, um, and he just kind of lets you go with the flow. Um, but a great movie experience. I mean, just quickly, he, Clint Eastwood is someone who is in the trenches with you. He, that guy wore fatigues every day. He was in landing craft with a camera on his shoulder. I mean, he was at the gym every day. He's a, you know, an amazing, amazing cinematic force and an amazing human being. I always find it quite an honor to play uh, anyone in uniform. I always feel it's, <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's such an other life to what, um, what I, you know, what I, my experience is. And I always feel that um, for me, as somebody who has an interest anyway in history, I try and get a sense of context. So I'll always perhaps do research material about the particular period, um, the Nazi that I played was uh, a guy uh, involved in the, uh, you know, the, the atrocities in in Hungary, which I knew nothing at all about, and um, so it, yeah, it's always a, a great honor to play um, to play. It. I, I love period dramas because I always get cast in them because of my face, <laughs> sideburns, you know. So that is while we're, what, you, please feel free to raise hands for the next question, but while I ask this, the, Alex may want to earmuff himself. How much beyond Washington Spies did you guys go to prepare for your roles for the three actors? I mean, you already, Heather's already talked about going on Google and other things, but <laughs> it, it's just, I mean, look, we do it, real story, we do it here too as well. Um, 
But, you know, the book is great. It has everything for Abe Woodhull as well. But are there other resources you went to? I mean, you do have some of the battlefields that have some of the resources. CIA actually has a very good history of the Tulpa Ring in this time period. If you haven't seen that, worth going to look at. Are, are, did you go beyond Alex's book to, to research the character and kind of get to know this time period? Yeah, um, sorry, I was look, I looked at the articles. I looked at, um, you know, books and tomes on gentlemanly conduct, um, articles of war, uh, what was expected of, um, of not so much soldiers, but of commanding, uh, you know, of, of majors, etc. You know, there was the whole um, uh, buying your way in, you know, uh, the the status of people buying your way in getting a commission you know there was uh lots of men who had absolutely no war um or warfare experience at all put in great positions um of power and of, and of influence simply buying their way in so i i sort of that's a personal thing that i do um just yeah sort of research as to as to the character's status and uh I think it was easier for uh, Owen reading about uh, uh, Benedict Arnold or for Ian reading about George Washington or for Seth Numerick reading about Ben Talmadge. Um, and I think Craig could tell you something anecdotal about um, Angus reading about Robert Rogers, right? He yeah, pretty much read a lot <laughs> about him. Well, Ang Ang Angus, uh, uh, yeah, like he, he brought to our attention that Robert Rogers was the first published um, American playwright in London. And he wrote this play um, about the persecution of the uh, American Indian by the British. And um, uh, it was not well received in London. And, um, <laughs> but he, uh, so we wrote a whole scene and we shot it and it was, it, we had to cut it for time uh, in, in uh, season one. Uh, where he goes into the detail about this play. But the idea that that guy, that crazy savage guy, you know, um, wrote this play. Mm. And, and you can read it, it's free on like Kindle or iBooks. You just get it, it's not, it's not that great. <laughs> <laughs> and you could tell like somewhere someone else took it over where he kind of gave up, you could see the, the style change. Um, but uh, yeah, so sometimes um, you'll get that you know, from the cast and try to incorporate it. Someone's coming to you, if um, not. I have one already, though. Is there a mic coming? Yeah, oh. You got it. Oh, no, they sorry. picked me sorry, already. <laughs> already. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, so like, I study intelligence right now, or I'm getting ready to as well. But one of the things that I kind of wanted to know is how much of a motivation is there to kind of become more educational on the actual acts of collecting and gathering intelligence is there in creating and writing the show? Because we do see a lot of very real techniques used. There's a lot about the drama and the story and all of that, but how much motivation is there to make sure we include the correct information and the actual really cool tools that we use to actually collect information in the time? Um, we try, uh, season two has a lot more of it than season one did. Cool. Um, awesome. We have a lot more, uh, I mean, tools. If you're going to talk about tools, we have a lot more gadgets this season. Yes. There was like, we introduced Sympathetic Stain, the Invisible Ink, uh, this season. Um, and we even do some stuff that I don't think has been seen on film before. We have um, uh, the first American submersible, the, the turtle, the American turtle, um, makes its appearance. And we had a, it's, it's going to be pretty awesome. Um, and uh, so, yes, there's a lot more uh, tradecraft this season now that the Culper Ring is actually formed and is, is sort of moving into action. I called on her. And, oh. oh, so. The segue was better with the earlier question, but my family is from Scotland, and I'm curious, specific to Roger's character, how uh, you were mentioning the Native American piece. Is any piece, especially given the current political uh, situation in Scotland after the ND referendum that happened last year, does any of that uh, inform the character in terms of the association and also the separation of the Scottish and British relationship? And will we see that explored through his 
Scotsman personality? Uh, yeah, I don't want to spoil anything, but um, but yeah, and Angus <laughs> Angus Angus himself was he flew back to Scotland to be involved in that. Yeah. Um, that's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he was, uh, and uh, I think his his side didn't win this time. Yeah. Uh, but you know, but um, uh, but yeah, he uh, and 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 there is it wasn't intentional. But now that you ask that question, there is a mirror of that that happens in this season uh, between Rob Rogers and uh, and the British. Um, but uh, yeah, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, sorry, thank you. I have a question for Mr. Rose. Um, I grew up in Huntington, so I, I learned about Nathan Hale from a young age, or I thought I did, <laughs> until, I, until I read your book. And, and I think it seems like kind of a, a common theme that we didn't really know any of this was going on or what was actually happening. Mm -hmm. So if you could just you know, talk about how, you know, over 200 years later, you, you know, were able to, to dig this up and put these pieces together you know, to tell this incredible story. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, about you know, Hale is um, Hale's you know is the great is the great figure in American espionage history, and uh, you know I you know I hope that we can uh, you know introduce him into the show at some point. I keep on mentioning this in public <laughs> forum in public fora, uh, so uh, one day I'll, I'll maybe taken up on this. But uh, about Hale, you know, there's um, you know, there's so many different. Uh, Tales about him, and I, th I think he's. When I was ri writing the book, um, you know, he was. Uh, you know, you, again, there were so many different ways of. of uh, nobody even knew which way he he went really, or what he was supposed to be doing. Um, uh, he certainly didn't. Um, and you know, so I, I I began I began to get become very very interested in Hale himself, and you know, what exactly was that was that mission of his? We sort of vaguely know. Of, oh, George Washington sent him to go spy on the British. But if you look at the timing of his mission and so forth, um, you know, he, he was sort of dogged by, by problems from the get-go. Um, it was never going to work. And then he, he fell prey to, to you know, to, uh, you know, uh, Rogers, you know, the, 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 the great sort of killing gentleman of the time. Um, and, you know, if, if you actually read the book, in hindsight, I, I devote quite a lot of time to Nathan Hale, considering he's not even a, a member of the Culpa Ring. Um, but, uh, you know, it's because I, I was actually beginning to think, hey, maybe I should write a biography of Nathan Hale. Um, and it got severely truncated for, the, for that chapter. Um, but, you know, again, Hale is, Hale is such an, an interesting figure in his own right um, that I just wanted to sort of try and really dig, in, dig into his story. And, of course, the great coincidence, of course, is that he was best buddies with Ben Talmadge at, at Yale. That was, that was the, 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 the key point. Uh, and that leads to all sorts of revelations about Talmadge's own motivations in real life about why he got into why he got into the into the business. So um, yeah, I mean, I said Hale is Hale is a quite, quite a fantastic person. I think he's been greatly misremembered. Um, so I hope to you know sort of I hope to sort of chip away at some of the myth and and get to the uh, to the man sort of existing below it below it. Hi, um, this is for our two British actors. I'm curious, what, what were, and this was talked about a little earlier, what were you taught as children about the American Revolution? All right, all right, listen, nothing. <laughs> nothing. 17. <laughs> 17, uh, 18, uh, like nothing. I mean, like, literally, um, I, I, nothing. The monarchy, lots of monarchy, lots of, like, you know, Elizabeths and Georges. Um, <sighs> so many Henrys and things like that. Um, Battle of Bosworth Field. Um, but no, literally, I mean, a little bit on colonies, nothing to do, really, in depth, about a major, major war that was waged on a place that we tried to take and lost. <laughs> they just like swept it under the rug. I mean, um, so th what's interesting about this show, you know, and mo and really more than anything, and what, what I really enjoy about the show, and I think being a part of it and what, what the show really focuses on, is that these people are really unsung <laughs> heroes, in a way, who really did risk, I mean, everything, you know? I mean, it's amazing that there isn't some monument 
to these people somewhere in this city who has monuments everywhere. You know, that, you know that, that, that there isn't anything documented really well known in the consciousness of these people that these young people, these young children, basically, who were just kind of starting out their lives, risked everything and, 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 and threw everything in uh, and really helped Washington and, and turned the tide of that war and established what we now know as the United States of America. It, it really blows my mind. But having done the show, I do know a lot more about it. <laughs> you know, I do. I really do. And getting to experience it every day on the set is, is great. It's really, there's nothing better than experiencing it and smelling it and living it and seeing it. So it's great. It, it's true. Uh, you know, Nathan Hale is, there's a statue of him, right, at the CIA? Um, it's, where is it? And there's also one. There's also it. one at CIA. Okay, yeah. so he's got a couple. And, and, yeah. and you know, he, he failed. His mission he failed. He, get got, caught, he got saying. caught and he got hanged. And, you know, the culpa ring uh, never got caught. And the mark of a, a, a truly great spy is that you never hear of them. <laughs> like, they're not famous. They're not famous. The most famous spies you'll hear of are the ones who were dead, dead yeah. or who, you know, like famously betrayed. like the, the, the real great spooks, you know. Um, go to the graves with their secrets. And it was on purpose, too, with them that they sort of had the opportunity at the end of their lives to reveal themselves. And they went all went to their graves with the information, right? We didn't know anything about them until yeah, the much after they died. Yeah, it's because Washington uh, kept their letters, and the protocol was to burn the letters. And they burned the letters from him, but he kept them against protocol. So. <laughs> Uh, he just didn't, he had a lot on his mind. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's how we know. That's They were found in the 1930s or something, right? right? Yeah, it was all the way well, into the, the, the 20th letters, century. The letters were, um, uh, so the, Sorry, the, uh, the, the letters were all in the uh, Washington papers at the Library of Congress. Um, but the thing is, is that there's hundreds of thousands of sheets of Washington correspondence. And though he had a most efficient secretarial staff, they were the ones who were filing all the copies uh, back and forth, um, much against the culpers, um, you know, uh, Ad admonition not to you know to burn everything, um, but they were all written in code and they were in under you know aliases and they were under initials and they were misfiled and so on. So it was only uh, fairly recently that we were able to put the entire culpa correspondence in sort of chronological order. There's about 150 letters back and forth uh, between them and the and the commander in chief. Just a quick question. Uh, during the uh, season opener, um, I was interested in the, the the relationship that you started building between um, exploring George Washington and his uh, the weight, great weight he has on his shoulders. A lot of popular um, film on him. We kind of he's always off to the side because he's a figure that we don't like to touch. Um, so I'm really excited that you guys are diving into that because um, he is. Got quite a, he it does have a much more human side. Um, that and then paralleling it with um, uh, <coughs> um, uh, uh, with uh, with King oh, um, King George yeah with King George. Um, I I like the the going back and forth, and I'm interested right, throughout the season. Are we going to see continue to see two leaders uh, as um, uh, or um, as they continue to evolve? Um, I'm very interested in seeing uh, what uh, with King George whether whether uh, are we going to see him. Um, I liked how the first reference uh, playing with the um, agricultural aspect. He was actually quite a, a brilliant guy, and how we kind of portray him as crazy King George, though and that's not necessarily the fact. But like playing um, later in life. But uh, are we going to see his evolution too as his empire is slipping away? Um, we d we don't have. Uh no, we don't have that many opportunities to cut back to him with everybody we start to introduce. Um, we do sort of return to that, that scene a little bit later in the season with, with him. Um, but uh, the contrast that we play more is between Benedict Arnold and Washington and two different types of commanders and how they uh, treat um, slights to their character. Um, but uh, yeah, we loved him because we loved uh, Paul Rice's performance as as King George is awesome. So like, and you know, he's still there. We can get to him at some point. Back to him, yeah. Well, Arnold's a good a good character to have a conversation. I didn't ask a question about that because Arnold is 
arguably the best U.S. commander at the time. I mean, Washington is holding the army together, but as far as a strategic and tactical commander on the battlefield, Arnold is above and beyond just about anybody. And at the point of most of this season, I would imagine, again, not give, want to give anything away, Arnold is going to come across as being that kind of guy, that top-notch character. Um, it, that's not what any of us learn. I mean, we, we learn that, yeah, it, you, you're Benedict Arnold, but you're a traitor. It had nothing to do with how good he was. And that makes it even doubly or triply worse in that it, it would be like if our, our best, if General Petraeus, well, he's not good anymore. Uh, <laughs> someone like that all of a sudden was working for the Iraqis, or, or you know, if, if Douglas MacArthur started fighting for the Japanese. I mean, it would be that kind of level of the top commander going over to the other side. Uh, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see how Arnold's evolution, I think evolution of all these characters is really what this show has been about. Uh, and, and Arnold's somebody I'm looking forward to seeing how that's going to come across. You do, however, see in episodes the effect of King George um, on the colonies and how uh, and its meaning to these characters. So you'll see that effect with others um, and that growth, no doubt. We have time for one more. I, I saw right there in the aisle. This is more of like a technical coming together question, but I was wondering kind of how this came to be. Um, did you write the book, then you, the producers got together, hired the actors, or just how, how did the story come to life and how did you get everybody together to produce this great production? He wrote the book, he found the book, <laughs> he gave the book to me, and I was like, check. whoa, we should, yeah, you gotta check. <laughs> and then we, yeah. then we tried to sell it, and then they said no, and then we tried to sell it somewhere else, and they said yes. And then we got checks, and then we wrote it. And then <laughs> I still haven't got any checks. So he hasn't got, that'll come, it'll, it'll get your check. And, um, and then, yeah, and then we, we cast the actors. But it was, it was, it was, a, it was kind of a long road, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty much straight. And I was, I was terrified when I wrote the first draft. I was terrified to contact Alex, I, you know, because I had made some changes, um, which I considered huge. Which nobody, you know, were like, like for example, Abe Woodhull's father was not a Tory; um, he was a, he was a patriot. But that that conflict, I thought, was so central um, to to what the war was really about. That, that you know, people were divided in, in their own homes, um, and uh, I was quaking in my boots. And then, and, and you know, Alex was like, "I love it! You know, so. I love it! I love it!" I didn't actually say it like oh, that, but yeah. come write the show. <laughs> All right, well, please join me in thanking the producers, cast, and writer of Turn.